we'll go ahead and get started with our uh, our panel discussion on industrial hemp. We have Alinda Luca, Lu Lucia with uh, the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, NASDA. Uh, we also have Joshua Kress, CDFA Plant Health and Pest Prevention uh, Services, and Dave Roberti with Roberti Ranch. So if the panelists that are here join us up at the uh, at the table, that would be fantastic. Eleni uh, <laughs> joined uh, NESDA in 2017 as Associate Director of Public Policy and was promoted to Senior Director of Public Policy in 2019. Uh, she leads the NS NASDA's policy team on strategy while also serving as the lead plant health hemp invasive uh, species and pesticide policy issues. Uh, Josh is a uh, branch chief with CDFA's Division of Plant Health and Pest Prevention Services and supervises the California Industrial Hemp Program. Uh, Dave Roberti is part of the Roberti Family Farming and Ranching Operation in Sierra Valley, established in 1922. The family has recently expanded into A24 Farming, a hemp growing operation for the next generation. So welcome everyone. Go ahead, you can go ahead and get started. I think we've got you connected. So wel welcome. Uh, thank you, can you guys hear me okay? We can, yes. Perfect, thank you so much for inviting me to the meeting today. I'm sorry that I cannot be there in person. The weather here in DC is not as, as good in, as it is in California. So trust me, I would love to be there. Um, but I appreciate the time today. And I was just asked to spend a, a few times here talking about um, what's happening uh, happening in the federal level as relates to HAMP. Um, but before I get started, I just want to talk a little bit um, about NASDA. So uh, NASDA, for those of you in the room that are not familiar with our organization, we're the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture. So we represent all the secretaries, commissioners, and directors of um, state departments of ag from all 50 states in the federal level. Um, NASDA has had um, policy um, supporting the um, legalization of hemp for quite a while. So we have been engaged in the 2014 Farm Bill um, passage of the, the hemp pilot program. And then of course in 2018, uh, we're also supportive and advocated for the provisions of hemp to be included in the Farm Bill as well. And since then, um, I've been spending about 80 or 90% of my time on hemp as you can potentially imagine. Um, but the 2018 Farm Bill truly established um, a, a new regulatory framework on how we're going to be regulating this new emerging crop. Um, just quickly going through the provisions, um, the, the 2018 Farm Bill uh, clearly established that um, the states or tribes cannot prohibit interstate commerce of hemp or hemp products. Um, it also uh, guides um, USDA to create a regulatory framework, a federal regulatory framework on how they are going to be regulating this crop. But it also gives the option for states to submit a state uh, plan and um, give the opportunity for states to regulate that crop. So if a state decides um, that they are not going to be submitting a state plan, then it falls to federal jurisdiction. Uh, and USDA is currently now establishing a regulatory framework on how we would regulate um, hemp in, in, in case in an event um, that a state decides to not um, regulate the, the crop. Um, the other thing that it does, it makes um, hemp um, um, crop eligible for a lot of the USDA programs. That being said, for you to be eligible at this point in time, you need to get a license. So there's a lot of um, procedural things that needs to be done before a grower can actually um, be eligible and access some of those uh, benefits from USDA at this point in time. Um, and last but not least, which is a piece that I'm very curious to see what's, what's gonna happen, but the 2018 Farm Bill also directs the USDA to come up with um, a report on the 2014 Farm Bill economic um, viability, right, and how the domestic um, hemp market 
um, might be shaping up. And that's something that uh, USDA is working very closely with the uh, University of Kentucky. Um, so the University of Kentucky is the lead in collecting that data. They're going to be passing that back to USDA. And USDA has until the end of the month um, to report back to Congress on some of that economic piece. Um, so where we are right now, um, as it relates to um, the federal right framework, um, so states, so the interim final rule came out. Um, uh, it's been almost short of a month. So the states can now start submitting state plans to USDA if they desire to do so. Um, that being said, most states have to change their laws or regulations to even being in compliance with USDA regulations. So a lot of states are sending a letter of intent to USDA, just telling them that they plan on submitting a state plan. Um, but they are, of course, doing their internal housekeepings and making sure that their plan and their laws and regulations allow them to submit a plan that is in compliance with USDA um, uh, requests. So USDA, after a state submits a plan, USDA has 60 days to approve that plan and, and get back to, uh, to the state. And then after that plan is approved, then growers can um, start applying for licenses within their state. Um, so we, and, and, and USDA is also within their 60 um, comment, um, 60 day uh, period comment here which is due December 20th. So NASA as an organization, we're gonna be submitting comprehensive comments. There's a lot of um, things within the rule that we potentially see as being burdensome for the states. Um, and just when you talk about resources and just little thing as, as like testing every single field or um, every single state now needs to have a DA approved lab. And I, I'm, I'm sure that you're gonna hear from Josh and some of the challenges from the states and, and just being compliance with some of the requirements. So, um, so I'll just say that there is a lot within that rule. That being said, because it's an interim final rule, uh, that rule is valid for two years. And after two years, we're gonna have an opportunity to shape that a little bit. So I'm, um, I wanna be optimistic and I'm very optimistic that USDA is gonna um, listen to our comments and concerns as relates to um, adapting and changing some of the rules to make sure that the states can be in compliance and are actually able to run a, a hemp program. When they're competing, the other piece that I, I forgot to mention, um, they're, the states are competing with the federal, uh, not competing is not the right word, right? But the other option would be the federal regulatory framework, which is um, free of charge for growers. The only piece that growers would have to pay is for the testing, everything else um, the federal government cannot charge growers to get a license under their their program. Um, so I, I will stop here as relates to USDA. There's a lot that is going to happen in the next couple of months, but I also just want to flag a little bit um, in, in, in as relates to EPA and FDA, right? Because um, I think USDA is just a piece of the puzzle here when we're talking about an emerging crop. Um, and when you're talking about EPA, we have engaged quite a lot of the agency as well and just making sure that they understand that um, hemp growers should have access to crop protection tools as well. So they need to be thinking on how they're gonna be registering the products and making sure that they have, um, the hemp growers have access to crop protection tools as well. Um, EPA has worked to expand the labels in 10 biopesticides and they're starting to work a little bit on the synthetic piece. And then of course the FDA piece is just um, about 80 or 90% of the production internally right now is going to CBD. So it's establishing a CBD regulatory framework that is clear and viable for hemp producers. Um, so they understand how they should be marketing their product and hopefully creating an interstate um, commerce for, for those producers as well. Um, so I will stop here because uh, I know that we're, I think we only have a half an hour um, and maybe take questions. I don't know if we we'll take questions now or later, but um, I appreciate the time today. Yeah, we'll go ahead and take questions right now and uh, open it up to anyone. On the federal, nothing. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 
So, I, 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 real quick, one quick question before we lose you here. So, isn't hemp being grown in other parts of the world and aren't there crop protection chemicals already registered outside of the U.S. that they have the data to support the use within the U.S.? Uh, synthetic, not that I'm aware of. And the, in Canada, they have some pesticides. It all depends on the use um, and how the, the crop is registered for use. So if you, I think the fear that they have is um, smoking. It's something that it, it requires a completely different um, risk assessment. So I think there's a lot um, on the EPA's mind as relates to that. But they, they are saying uh, the, the latest conversation that I had with the EPA um, they were very honest with me and they said that it's going to probably be between five and ten years before they have the data that they need to move forward with synthetic pesticides. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Gentlemen, which of you uh, wants to do the short story? Yep, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Um, I can go first. I'll, my name is Joshua Kress. I'm the branch chief for the pest exclusion branch uh, here at CDFA in the plant health division. Um, one of my programs is the industrial hemp program. I just have a quick update, and I'll try to go really fast because I know we're short on time. Um, but I gave an update here back in March. Um, so it'll just be kind of things that have happened since March, and I'll touch briefly on some of the, the federal stuff as well. <clears throat> um, so very quickly, we, um, at the last meeting, our regulation to establish a uh, registration fee um, so that way growers could register with the county agricultural commissioners that was um, open for public comment um, that uh, public comment period closed and we were able to adopt those regulations effective on april 25th um, so starting on april 30th we were able to announce that registration was available with the county agricultural commissioners um, so since that time many of the commissioners have um, got had registrants in their counties um, so to date um, and our data is always a little bit behind because we receive the information from the county agriculture commissioners once they've completed their review and then we get everything entered into our own internal databases um, so we always we're receiving new applications every day but to date we have 591 registrants in 32 different counties um, with a total of 36,632 registered acres um, as of what the staff had processed yesterday <clears throat> um, we have a list of registrants that's available on our website. It's updated weekly. Um, we also have a summary of uh, the total registration numbers that's um, online, and we update that information monthly. Um, we do not currently have data on actual planted acreage, harvest information, or um, any destruction at this point. Um, so we're still working with the counties to receive that information. So right now, really the only statewide data that we have at this point is registered um, acreage. Um, in addition to that, we did adopt by emergency um, regulations for sampling and testing on um, uh, June 10th. Um, the emergency regulations are in effect for up to 180 days. Um, right now, that ends, I believe, this week. So right now we're in the process of readopting those emergency regulations. Um, we did propose um, regulations to permanently adopt, uh, to amend and permanently adopt sampling, testing, and destruction regulations. Um, those were proposed on October 18th. Um, the written comment period just ended yesterday. Um, however, as I'm about to explain, we'll be uh, reviewing not only those comments, but also some changes that have occurred since um, October. So we had two things that have happened recently. Um, number one is that Senate Bill 153 this year was passed, which Rachel may have touched on earlier, um, that was approved by the governor on October 12th, and most of its provisions take effect on January 1st, which amends our industrial hemp law. Um, the stated intent of that is to bring our California law into compliance with federal law. So most of the changes are intended to mirror what's in federal law. <clears throat> um, there were some additional cleanup provisions, um, but one of the main points is that it requires CDFA to submit our state regulatory plan to USDA that um, LNA was just talking about by May 1st of next year. Um, so we are required by law to submit a plan by May 1st. Um, so we're currently working on reviewing the changes and determining what um, further adjustments need to be made um, to our existing and proposed regulations. Um, however, shortly after that, the um, as was just mentioned, USDA established their own interim federal rule um, to establish their own regulations on October 31st. Um, so as with goes with hemp, things are continuously changing. 
Um, so we're in the process of analyzing that. Um, we have already had the opportunity to meet with USDA to start that conversation. Um, one of the requirements of the Farm Bill is that USDA provides guidance and assistance to states to develop and submit their plan. Um, so we're actively taking them up on that. Um, <clears throat> so we've, we've begun those Excuse me, we've been begun those conversations. We have not yet submitted our proposed state plan, um, but we've begun the conversation with USDA to begin the process to do so early next year. Um, we'll continue to update people, um, update the public via our mailing list and our website as far as our process in that, but at this point, um, we're just actively reviewing those regulations and determining what changes we need to make. Um, the state's regulatory plan is just your laws and regulations. So we have to look at what our current regulations are, what our proposed regulations are, and determine what needs to change um, based off of the federal regs as well as the updates to California law. Um, regardless of those changes, any grower would need to comply with both California and federal law. Um, so we're actively working, again, with our board, with the county agricultural commissioners uh, to make sure everybody is aware of those things. Um, and then a couple other things that have come up since then. Um, <laughs> one of the things that came up at the last meeting was the question of pest issues. So we have two of those that have come up um, since this last meeting. Uh, number one was the cannabis aphid for on cannabis. Uh, for, we had some fines that licensed cannabis cultivation facilities earlier this year. As initially proposed to be rated A, which would be a quarantine level pest, um, due to the fact that we had no record of that pest being submitted through our lab, which is surprising, I'm sure. And, um, and it, you know, we didn't really know where it was in California or what the impact would be. Of course, since we did that, um, the counties and um, Cal Cannabis staff have gone out and we've since found it and gotten official samples from a wide range of cannabis growers throughout California. Um, we've already downgraded that pest to a C, uh, which would be a pest that's of common occurrence, um, still impactful, but of common occurrence, we don't take quarantine action. Um, <clears throat> We also have one um, pest that's impacted for one of our state exterior quarantines. Uh, cannabis is a host for European corn borer. And so we, um, which is a quarantine that we've had since at least, as far as I can tell, at least the 1970s. Um, so the known infested area for European corn borer is basically the almost the entire US east of the Rockies, uh, including portions of Colorado. So um, it's a common pest that's grown, it uh, impacts a lot of the areas where people are currently growing hemp and cannabis, um, certainly hemp. Um, we have added um, plants and plant parts of cannabis species as a host um, of European corn borer to our state exterior quarantine, um, with the exception of seeds for planting and human consumption, dried flowers and leaves, extracted fiber, and extracted oil. Um, so any regulated commodities, including cannabis species coming from any of those regulated areas, would need to be certified to be free from European corn borer. Uh, it's not just a concern to California, it's also a concern to other Western states that have mirroring um, state exterior quarantines. Um, but these are really probably the first two of many new pests and diseases that we're going to be finding. Uh, so one of the things that we're working on is that we are, um, we don't have a good baseline of what pests and diseases are actually out there in the world um, of cannabis and hemp, even though it's been growing here for a very long time. So we've been working with um, Cal Cannabis as well as the County Agricultural Commissioners, and we will be um, trying to conduct a statewide survey of hemp and cannabis plantings um, to determine what that baseline level is and try to figure out what pests are common um, before we start taking quarantine action on what at this point is a very high value crop. Um, you know, we don't want to repeat the situation we have with cannabis aphid where we could potentially be destroying large numbers of plants for something that's already out there um, thoroughly distributed in cannabis. Um, so that's something that we're actively working on. Um, and then we will be having another Industrial Hemp Advisory Board meeting coming up in January if anyone's interested in attending. And um, with the change to California law, we do have a two additional board members that we will be adding two additional growers. Um, so we'll be posting that early next year as well for those that are interested. Right. That's a brief overview if there's any questions. Great, thank you. Yeah, we'll wait, we'll wait for questions till the end on that. So, uh, so Dave, it's all yours. Well, thank you very much. My name is Dave Roberti. Um, we're uh, farmers up in uh, Plumas County, up uh, north of Truckee, about 35 miles. And uh, so we don't have some of the same issues that uh, some of the valley growers have with the hemp, pests being one of them, because nothing wants to live in freezing weather, it seems like. So that, that's a help to us. Um, I want to introduce myself a little bit to you on the sense that uh, um, Although we were a uh, small acreage growing this year, uh, this was our second year of growing. We, uh, last year we put in about 100 acres and we thought we were really gonna do something good. 
and this year we decided no let's figure this out and so we scaled back to 20 acres and to give you a perspective uh, our 20 acres this year produced about three times what our 100 acres produced last year so uh, needless to say our first year was not successful uh, this year I would consider successful and um, let's see is there a button I'm supposed to push here on the right and so we, we can just scroll through a few of these but uh, um, I'm not going to talk about them specifically but uh, uh, we, we can so when we started growing two years ago we got into it for the reason because we're mostly alfalfa and beef cattle uh, operation alfalfa operation is mostly about 80 percent of our hay that we produce goes to the dairy industry dairy industry is having some real struggles I don't know how long the dairy industry is going to survive in California, therefore that has a tremendous impact on me as an alfalfa grower. It's time to start looking for an alternative. Um, being in the area that we are, where frost is uh, pretty prevalent and a uh, pretty short growing season, avocados don't do well, um, along with a lot of other things. And so when hemp arrived, it's v pretty frost tolerant and a pretty short growing season. And so we thought, let's give it a try. We knew nothing about it, um, like most of the general public. That's been one of our real challenges, is education. When we spend 10 minutes with somebody, they get it. But the first 10 minutes is a real challenge because all they figure is, it's just another, another drug. You know, it's still marijuana. It's in their minds because it's been tied to that so long. So education has been a real real challenge for us and we've had a lot of field tours uh, a lot of uh, people come out and we've been very open to that uh, from our supervisors county supervisors down to even had the ffa state ffa leadership come out last year and took a tour and was just amazed at what they saw and we're excited about it what excites me is it's finally being recognized as an agricultural crop that's another challenge of convincing people that it really is um, and this isn't just as smoke and mirrors of trying to get around it. Um, we began our growing with a partnership with the University of Nevada, Reno, uh, doing research for us. Those part of that research included, and I'm not going to go into real specifics. You can ask questions later if you'd like. Uh, plant density, how close of uh, density should you plant to get the maximum production? Uh, water uh, conservation versus the alfalfa. Um, First year we ran it uh, just overhead with a irrigation pivot, um, and uh, this year we actually used some uh, some plastic mulch and drip tape. Uh, compared to alfalfa, I think uh, we probably used about 15% of the water. Um, uh, and of course, that's using the mulch tape, which helps with evaporation and things, but it was tremendously less. Um, they also are looking at optimum time to harvest, looking at where, how do you identify in that plant just by looking at it when the optimum time to harvest is, when you can hit that peak CBD without going over the 0.3% uh, THC. They're looking at the ratio of CBD and the strains, uh, ratio of CBD to THC, and does that track all the way through, or does one spike at a certain time and not another, so that we've been looking at that. Um, and also um, the pest invasion, and so far, they haven't found anything for pest invasion. Um, we've had a good, this year was a great experience in growing. We had a good crop. I'll try to find a good picture of, here's where we're doing some planting, laying the mulch. Yeah, we will, there we go. There's my wife and I, and I think that was in about August. Um, most of our plants got up into the, about the six foot tall range, um, beautiful plants. Um, so we had a great growing season. I do want to comment um, that California, we were really frustrated for taking so long to get hemp going, but you got it right. And so that's a good thing. Uh, our experience anyway on our end was a great experience working with our, our Ag Commissioner, working with the state as far as uh, the regulations that took place. Um, I felt like California got it right. And I'll comment later on what I think USDA did. But uh, um, issues going forward, um, uh, or in growing, uh, labor. Labor is a huge issue. Very, very labor intense right now. Um, and a lot of that is because of lack of harvesting, mechanical harvesting equipment. That's going to come. Everybody and their brothers working on converting something to figure out how to do this mechanically. And I think that's going to get there. Um, it's expensive to harvest right now. Uh, but that's, again, I think that'll get fixed. All these things are a matter of time for this crop to become 
kind of a, a standard crop, and these, most of these things will be fixed. Uh, we had a real challenge in drying the plants this year. Um, I think we hung, go back to here a little bit, we did hang some in uh, barns, there you go, um, to dry. Um, very labor intense of bringing it in from the field and, and then hanging it. Um, and the problem we found was without it being a sealed up barn, climate controlled, every night that the dew would come in, the plants would soak up the humidity again and you'd be right back to day one. And so when the north wind started blowing finally in October and everybody was mad about that, <laughs> we were happy. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, drying was a real challenge for us. Um, Everybody knows the lack of processing is an issue. Again, that's going to get fixed down the road. I hear a lot of talk, a lot of different people talking about putting in some processing, uh, but right now it is a huge log jam and expensive because the processors know they can get it. If you want your stuff processed now, give me 60% of your crop and we'll do it for you. If you want to wait three, four months, eh, maybe I'll do it for 40%. Uh, so it's still very expensive, but again, that'll get fixed. Concerns going forward. Uh, one of our biggest concerns are, is the USDA regs that just came out. The testing protocol, I think, along with all these, uh, is really going to put the handcuffs on growing hemp. Um, under the USDA regs, I probably won't take the risk. I won't take the gamble. It's not worth it because most of the crops with today's breeding, and the breeding is going to get better over time too with the THC levels, by testing only the top portion of the plant, 80 to 90 percent of the fields are going to fail, and that means you destroy them. I'm not going to invest fifteen, twenty thousand dollars an acre to take the chance on having it destroyed. One of the problems I have with that is most of the field is what we call biomass. We're taking the entire plant and using that, but that's not what USDA is saying we're going to test. Well, but that's what I'm producing. Um, so we got to match what's being produced with what's being uh, tested and, and meeting the criteria. Um, the 15 days, and I'm sure you probably all heard these things, 15 days before harvest and testing, I think is going to be a real challenge, especially in rural areas. Um, talking with some guys out in Nevada, and they say it takes them three days to get to eastern Nevada, and then where do I go with it? And so by the time I get it to a lab, and if it's only a DA lab, um, how long is it going to take them to produce? Well, there's going to be a huge, huge problem there with the 15A testing. Um, the DEA lab, again, is another problem. Um, one of the questions I've had, which is kind of a rhetorical question, unless one of you can answer it, it's always bothered me where this 0.3% came from. Where's the science behind it? My understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is some guy 30 years ago given a speech and it was asked, well, what level of THC should be allowed? And he said, I don't know, pick a number. How about 0.3%? Where's the science behind it? I think this 0.3% is, is, is wrong. Um, Maybe when, when breeding gets to a point where we can breed out more of the THC, okay, maybe we can scale it. But until we get to that point, I, I don't, everybody I talk to, and I don't know by experience, let me share, share you, says the THC will not have a psychoeffective uh, action on somebody until you get up into that 5% range. 5%, not 0.5. And I think if we were able to raise that to the 0.5 or 0.6, somewhere right in that neighborhood, that's going to relieve a lot of the pressure. Um, so I don't know how that goes about, but, um, and I think that's where I'll leave it because I've way overshot my time probably. Um, and I'll click through pictures real quick and while you're, if you got some questions and, uh, if you got some questions on our field there, uh, shoot those at me too. But thank you for your time. I really appreciate uh, being able to come before you and, uh, and speak to you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go ahead and open it up for questions and we're going to, we're going to go question for up, up to 10 minutes and no longer. So. So you guys know ahead of time we're going to cut it off. So who wants to go first? Eric? Sure. Quick question. Do, do you have any uh, infield technology that can give you an idea as a farmer of what the percentage is on T THC? No. Currently there's no nothing that's, that's uh, accurate. Um, I've heard stories, and we, it was kind of funny because we tried one at our supervisor's meeting. Another grower in our area um, had bought one off of eBay or something, I don't know, that was supposed to give you at least, uh, it would tell you if it, was, if it was marijuana or if it was hemp. It, was, it would go to like 1% uh, or something. So you know if it was over that, it's marijuana. If it's under that, it's probably hemp. Nothing accurate. So we decided to test that one day in our supervisor's meeting, and our sheriff was a part of this uh, committee. And... Uh, and so the people said, you know, 
we'd like to test it. So far, we're coming up with a zero reading on our hemp, but we don't know that it's working or not, but we have no marijuana to test it again. He says, well, just a minute. And he gets on the phone and calls up, calls up and says, hey, can you bring me down samples three and four from uh, the, and so uh, they tested it and it still didn't work. So, uh, so as of now, I don't believe there is. Um, I believe it's in the works and I think it will come, but right now I don't think there is. I have a question on the regulatory side, a couple of questions. Number one, uh, I'm hearing lots of complaints on the uh, seed stock and the variability of seed stock. And so is that going to eventually be resolved by uh, a trade association or a marketing order that, that, will, um, that will set up the guidelines for that? And then secondly, um, <clears throat> rice came into California uh, through from Japan in a golf bag one year, and um, what is what is California doing to prevent exotic uh, varieties of hemp or and or uh, cannabis from coming in and from around the world? Uh, and do you have ways to trace that? Uh, just again for any pests that might be attached. Yeah, <laughs> I guess I'll take that one. Um, so. Um, to start with about seed, so um, hemp is regulated under the Federal Seed Act. We're currently working on adding it to our list of agricultural seeds in the California seed law as well. Um, so that will, the, the things that apply to other agricultural seeds would also apply to hemp. Um, we're not sure exactly what that's gonna look like when we start trying to enforce um, germination standards, but um, there, are, there are tests available, they are good, so um, that is something that we're actively working on. Um, and then locally, the California Crop Improvement Association is involved with their national um, parent organization actively working on the certification of hemp crops, um, and that's actually become not just a local effort, it's actually now a national effort um, to certify hemp varieties, and so that process is ongoing. Um, there are not a lot of certified varieties available yet, um, but I mean, there are plenty that are going through the works. Um, so hopefully that'll help to alleviate some of those concerns as we move forward. Yeah, we've heard, certainly heard stories of people bringing in um, seed that would not necessarily comply with the Federal Seed Act. So we are working also with the County Agricultural Commissioners on that activity and trying to take action where appropriate. Um, as far as hemp coming in or cannabis coming in from out of the state or out of the country, um, so as was mentioned earlier, interstate um, movement is allowed as long as it meets um, quarantine requirements. So as I mentioned, we do have one currently state exterior quarantine. Um, I'm sure there will be more as we figure out what it's a host for and what it's not. Um, as far as bringing it in internationally, I don't believe that's currently allowed, um, but that would be kind of a question that we would work with USDA. We do get a lot of questions on where can I bring it in from and where can I send it to? I know a lot of people are interested in growing seed here and then trying to get a phytosanitary certificate to ship it out. And so that's something we're actively working with APHIS on. Um, there's not a lot of information available yet, but it is certainly forthcoming. Uh, for Dave, uh, was your hemp used for cigarettes or for oil? And is there a difference in value? And also, did you have any issues with mold? We'll start with the last part of it first. No, we didn't have any issues with mold. Um, we're, because I think a lot of it has to do with we live in a pretty arid climate where we're at, uh, up in the high desert there. And so I think that is one advantage for us. I've heard of some mold issues uh, down through the valley in certain areas where it's higher humidity and they do have some problems. Um, our, ours was grown for CBD oil. Um, we have not sold it yet. We still have it in, uh, in storage, um, but we also did uh, Kind of the new thing, or not new, but a, a growing market this year is uh, what they call smokable buds. Um, and uh, so we did try some of that this year, have not sold it yet either, um, still have it. But um, mo yeah, most of our product is, probably 90% of our product will be for CBD oil and extraction, yes. Just a quick question. Um, does hemp smell as much as pot does? <laughs> well, I can give you my opinion. Um, that was one of our real concerns because we've been working with, uh, we're right on the border of Plumas and Sierra County, and so we work with both counties basically. Um, our ag commissioner covers both counties, but they're small counties. 
Uh, one of our concerns in working with the planning commissions there and, and working on zoning of where to allow hemp was do we have setbacks, do we have, you know, different things, and one of the concerns was the smell. Um, and so, and this was early on, this was back in probably July, um, and there was, the plants when they're young don't have much of a smell at all, um, unless you get them in a real confined area. Um, and so we had a field tour, brought uh, planning commissions out and uh, different ones from the, from the county uh, once the plants got matured. And they were amazed how little they smelled compared to marijuana, especially. Uh, what You can walk through the field and you're not plugging your nose thinking, oh my gosh, this is overwhelming. Um, they do have a scent, but so do almost every other agricultural crop, but not to a point I would say is intrusive upon you know, people's um, that are gonna be nearby. Um, once you get them into a concentrated area, then it does get a little stronger, of course, um, but, uh, but just in the field, uh, we didn't, it does have a smell, but nothing like uh, marijuana, I believe, yeah. So, I'm gonna throw in it. Dave, so how did you know which variety to plant? And I mean, you're in a, you're in a high desert location, it's a little unusual, and so how did you go about deciding what to put in? Did you have a buyer that suggested, or how'd that work? Uh, flipping a coin, you know? Uh, no, uh, it wasn't quite that bad. We, we did have a couple of people that uh, are also uh, agronomists and growers and, uh, and worked as a consultant with us a little bit. Um, and so we tried, f well, actually five different varieties. One variety did not do well at all. Um, uh, but we tried uh, basically five different varieties to see which one would work best in our area. Um, two of them did well. Um, one of them grew really well, but just took too long to mature, and so it didn't do well as far as the, the CBD oil. Um, so we learned a lot through that. Uh, the gentleman that we were working with, the agronomist, um, he's got a variety that they've been working on for a couple of years that we may try this year um, that he thinks will work very well for our area. One of the things we were working with the University of Nevada with, uh, because basically all of northeastern California and northwestern Nevada are almost kind of the same climates, cold, dry, and so the uh, university there was real interested in working with us, saying, hey, if we can get something figured out that'll work in Sierra Valley, we can grow it anywhere up in the north, uh, east of California and northwestern Nevada. And so, um, um, so there are some varieties. Uh, a neighbor grew a different variety than we did that did very well, um, and so, the varieties are getting there. Uh, it's just like everything else. You got to wait till the breeding gets set for your climate. Yes. Well, fascinating, fascinating uh, presentation. Boy, the challenges of a new crop. Um, we've uh, tr started growing quinoa probably five years ago, and and then just has a whole, um, a whole, uh, you know, list of things that just haven't been decided. But nobody asks us on quinoa whether we smoke it or, uh, or make oil, uh, which is, you know, is uh, unique to your crop, isn't it? Um, so, you know, I, I think last meeting I let everybody know I hate the keto diet. I, I hate the keto diet because, you know, it doesn't add, allow for rice or for quinoa in that diet. And uh, I uh, have a couple people on my team that uh, practice or they're keto diet evangelists. But I was wondering if, uh, if you have that same rule on your operation, um, if your team, uh, you, you want them to, uh, to promote your... Um, your crop? Do they have preference on smoking it or or, um, or, or oil? Well, as far as uh, our family operation, uh, none of us are smokers, <laughs> so we haven't gone that far yet. Um, I have had a lot of people tell me that uh, being able to smoke it and and take the CBD directly like that does have a different impact on pain control and different things than, than taking it through oils. Um, and that's one of the other areas that I think is really going to expand. Everybody's talking right now about CBD, but there's so many other characteristics of the hemp plant that are going to be used. Right now, the, the hysteria, if you want to call it, that is on the CBD, and I think there's a lot of positive to it. Uh, CBG, I'm told, is going to break things open sometime in the near future. Uh, that's going to, uh, but they don't really even know the reaction yet. Um, and I've always been in my education talks. Um, I think the fiber is where, in 10 years from now, the fiber is going to be what everybody's going to want to grow for. I think it's going to revolutionize a lot of things in our in our country as far as uh, uh, being able to use it. I was always thinking it was going to be the fiber too. About, about 10 years ago, we came out with a hemp rice cake. We called it Hempalicious. It had a short life cycle and, and moved, moved away. Um, um, 
Josh, uh, I was just wanting to make a comment about your cannabis aphids. Uh, is that a, a relatively high priority pest? No. Speaking about, you know, I was just kind of surprised that there was a cannabis aphid. I did not know that, and, and it would be high, wouldn't it, a high priority pest? <laughs> and it might take exception to being called a C grade pest. I just uh, thought, wow. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Well, so with that. Yeah, we, we have to cut this off. Okay. We, if we don't, we're going to be in big trouble with the governor. With me. And, with me. Okay, <laughs> even more important. <laughs> so thank you both for uh, joining us today. Really informative, and I guarantee you we have a lot, of, lot and, more questions. And if you can hang around, then they can ask questions. Yeah, that would be great. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, our next uh, speaker is Nancy Vogel from the uh, Governor's Water Portfolio Program. Nancy is the director of the Governor's Water Portfolio Program at the California Natural Resource Agency. Yeah, this other place so we're, you are welcome to be at the wherever front of the, where, be, wherever you feel <laughs> comfortable, you're more than welcome. Thank you. So welcome, and uh, I Thank know you. you guys have to. You yeah, know, we have a 2.30 meeting, yep. but we'll make it, we'll make it. Thanks for giving me some time on the agenda today. Really appreciate that. and. Um, I'll give you a quick update on the water resilience portfolio, but before I do, I would like to thank the board for the time you made on your agendas in Reading and San Luis Obispo and Fresno earlier this summer to give the public a chance to offer input on the water resilience portfolio, because by doing that, you helped us reach people we might not have heard from otherwise. And I would also like to thank the several board members that I see that I've spoken to one-on-one -on -one representing organizations other than the board of of food and agriculture. Eric and I spent a couple hours yesterday morning discussing the portfolio in a group. Um, anyway, I, I've appreciated those conversations and learned a lot from them. And I would also like to thank Secretary Ross and Under Secretary Moffat for all the time they've put into the water resilience portfolio. They've been an important part of the interagency team working on this and from the beginning, which would be about May. So for those of you who haven't spent the last six months thinking about nothing but the water resilience portfolio like I have, I'll give you a quick update. So in late April, the uh, governor issued an executive order that directed the Natural Resources Agency and the California Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Food and Agriculture to work together to create a portfolio, which I think of as a suite of integrated actions that would together help foster water resilience across California. And by water resilience, I tend to think of the ability to withstand disruptions, to recover from those shocks to the system and to learn from those experiences. So um, we started out in June. I will cut to the trace, chase because I think you probably want to know exactly what is the status of the water resilience portfolio. We started, yeah. <laughs> well, we started out in June hoping that we would have a draft in October for the public, and uh, we don't. Um, we didn't. But it uh, hopefully will be out for public review within several weeks, if not less. And, and we will give the public as much time as we can, ideally several weeks at least, to, to comment on the draft and to help us refine it before we deliver it to the governor in January. Um, so we are deep in internal review. Stay tuned. And um, I, I would like to mention, and poor Eric, he heard all this yesterday, but the, the several drivers, I'll make this quick, several drivers for why we need to focus so intensely right now on water resilience. One is the natural variability in our precipitation that we've always, that's always marked California. You know, we have the most variable precipitation of any state and, um, you know, we depend very heavily on a several storms a year between November and March and that's why Thanksgiving was such a happy Thanksgiving for so many of us <laughs> because <laughs> I was a, the skies were getting painfully blue. So let's hope there's more to come. Um, and we also know that climate change, as the average temperatures warm are going to, you know this as well as anyone, the Sierra snowpack and the, uh, the, our, our propensity for drought and flood will change, et cetera. And we have to have systems in place to capture water when it is available and be ready for just about anything. Because the historical record that we counted on to tell us kind of what the, the, you know, the, the, the range might be of what we could expect that's out the window now. 
And on top of that, we've got 10 more million more Californians that we have to be able to provide for by 2050. That's what the demographers tell us to expect a population of 50 million by, by 2050. And at the same time we do all that, as you all know, we've got the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act to implement, the Conservation as a Way of Life laws to implement, the Safe Drinking Water Act to implement so that we don't have a million Californians who are without safe um, and reliable water supplies. So there are a lot of things out there that um, come together in ways that I don't think we can fully anticipate right now that we need to prepare for. In the uh, executive order, the governor asked us to uh, inform the portfolio with extensive public outreach and stakeholder input, and you helped us with that. We've had about 20 public meetings around the state uh, where, the folk, where the public could come offer their input. Um, I've met one-on-one -on -one with more than 60 representatives of stakeholder groups, or I should say representatives of more than 60 stakeholder groups at least, and then we've gotten great substantial input, written input from uh, more than 100 groups and individuals, and I really appreciate the care and the thought and the experience behind that input. It's been helpful. The executive order also asked that we inventory and assess various aspects of California water, including water quality, water supply and demand that's both existing, projected, regional and statewide. We have done that in an appendix that uh, depends heavily upon information from the Department of Water Resources and the State Water Resources Control Board. And in the appendix, we, we package up that inventory and assessment in a regional way because as you all know, there's no one size fits all with California water. The regions vary too tremendously. Um, the recommendations in the water portfolio will are guided by the governor's executive order in which he asks us to incorporate multi-benefit approaches, partnerships, a, a watershed scale coordination, innovation and technology, integration of state programs and efforts, and, um, and happy Healthy Soils Week, last but not least, natural infrastructure, which, as Brian Joby said at a Water Commission meeting um, a few months ago, natural infrastructure starts, the foundation of it starts with soil, as you know. So um, within the water portfolio, we have four main rubrics, and we've called these maintain and diversify water supplies, protect and enhance natural systems, build connections, whether they're human, physical, digital, and be prepared. And within those four rubrics, we have plenty of actions um, that, uh, that, this, that the state should take on in, in the next few years. And the fundamental ethos, if I can call it that, of the water resilience portfolio is regional networks, state support. As you're aware, it's local government that by and water districts and local governments that by and large are delivering and cleaning and um, maintaining water systems across California. According to the Public Policy Institute of California, of the $33 billion a year that are spent managing water in California, 85% of that is spent by locals, raised and spent by locals. And so the, the local districts do have um, uh, the main responsibility to secure water supplies, to protect our natural river systems, and to reduce flood and drought risks, and to work together to plan and prepare. But the state has an important role in all of this as a funder, a regulator, a policy setter, a collector and keeper of data, and the manager of some pretty important interregional infrastructure. So the portfolio, with our actions, we attempt to spur and support regional coordination and planning and preparation and investments while also pushing state agencies to integrate their work to support those regions. For example, it's pretty clear that stakeholders understand the value of multi-benefit projects. Now it's up to the state to figure out how to take these complex projects that often involve multiple parties and figure out how to make it easier to permit and then pay for and get them built. And relatedly, we also heard from many stakeholders that they would truly appreciate state investments in better climate information, a watershed scale sense of that, that's, that's trustworthy and consistent, that, that, that tells you this is what you can expect water managers within your watershed over the next 20, 50, or 100 years based on the best available science. And obviously, that would have to constantly be updated. Um, so I think you'll find that within the water resilience portfolio, there is no magic reform, there's no 
upheaval of institutions. Um, instead, we're trying to accelerate what we see as good momentum for far-sighted planning and thoughtful investments and integrated management and unprecedented co collaboration, because we need that both at the regional level and at the state level. Because we think that that's what it's gonna take to build water resilience across the state. So it's not all that exciting, it's a hard slog, but it's important. And I uh, look forward to your input when the draft comes out, which hopefully will be soon. And I thank you for your time today, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions. Eric, go ahead. Yeah, good to see you again, Nancy. You too, Eric. We were together yesterday at the California Environmental Dialogue, which is <coughs> kind of a multi-stakeholder uh, deal. So um, sometimes it helps to hear things twice. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, my question is actually kind of a uh, question about the term resilience and whether you feel like it's resonating with the public. Um, you know, you, you had 20 um, public hearings. We, we were part of a couple of them, right? Um, and in, again, in our organization, we're talking a lot about that, that term as well. So it's kind of relatively new in the parlance, and I'm just curious what kind of feedback you're getting and whether you feel like, um, what, is it, what does it represent to folks? Yeah. I. Um sometimes try to avoid that word and simply say, be ready for anything. We know that the droughts will be more intense, most likely with average warmer temperatures, and that the rain, that, that precipitation will fall as rain in more intense storms than a snowpack that's nice and safe and secure that melts slowly in the Sierra. So I don't know that resilience resonates with the public at large any more than say sustainability did or does, because it seems resilience is the new <laughs> although they're, they mean different things, but they are related. Um, but I think people grasp that in a, anyone who's lived in California for any period of time understands you do have to be ready. And, you, and, and, and to be able to capture water when it's available requires preparation and planning, and that's what the portfolio is about. Thank you, thank you so much for your presentation and also for uh, this extraordinary effort. One of the um, big findings that we had in our hearings was um, the concern for the uh, farming community on the assumption that hundreds of thousands of acres will be fallowed. And I wanted to know if in the portfolio there will be just that as something to be done or if there is some plan already being um, devised for how the state can help those communities. So I would not look to the portfolio to have all the details on how to, and I'm looking to Karen for help here, on how to mitigate what we know will be big social and economic effects as a sigma is implemented that will not be detailed in the portfolio but it's, it, it, is, it is addressed, and, and there is an acknowledgement that we know this is coming. It goes well beyond water in some ways when you're talking about the health of communities, um, and, and it's about economic resilience in some ways. So um, help me out, Karen. Yeah, so, yeah, there is an acknowledgement of that, um, and how do we provide the support for that, but it goes way beyond um, the boundaries of water itself. From the beginning of Sigma, I've said the state needs a rural development strategy because these communities that are going to be hardest hit by Sigma are because they're overly reliant on one driver of their economy, and that's agriculture. So what is it that we can do? And I think that this there's several things going on right now. There's the water resiliency portfolio, and we want to make sure that it aligns very nicely with what we're doing to update a final draft of our natural working landscapes. And then there's regions rising where they heard about two things at every meeting they had, Sigma and broadband. They heard about that because they were mostly in interior counties that are going to be front and center of Sigma. So it goes way beyond just a water thing. We have to find every molecule of water that we can. Um, and I'm very mindful of Mr. Gallo and others who also feel that we have to do whatever we can to minimize the total number of acres that are fallowed, um, which is challenging. 
but it's it goes much broader than just the natural resource agencies being at the table. But we acknowledge that there is a need to develop strategies and tools. Yeah. That said, I would I would say that the portfolio does have uh, quite a few actions related to recharge. I mean, we acknowledge that that we've got to get in place the the human and the digital and the physical systems and the regulations and so on that will allow us when the water is available to capture it in ways that don't harm our natural systems, but do allow regions to recharge as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Just a quick question. Do you, um, I really understand the incredible work you guys are putting into this, so thank you very much. Um, but also recognizing that though you've had a lot of input all the way up to it, there is a period of time where the public will want to give some feedback on what you're developing. From your perspective, given that you've been sandwiched on multiple ends around this, what's the minimum time that you think you need to allow for public feedback and comment once you actually uh, put the plan in, in the public view? We would love to give people as much time as possible. Um, I, I'd say a month at least. Um, there are a lot of people that have been paying close attention to the water resilience portfolio and put a lot of thought and effort into to their recommendations and I truly appreciate that. It's one of the things I love about the water world is, is the way folks were able to look in many cases beyond their own interests to the overall state interest. Um, and I, that won't be a lot of time but I, we do need to at least several weeks I think. Um, I just want to say, well, two things. First, thank you, because I've seen you at work, and I know <laughs> how much you have coming at you from all sides, and I just, I'm kind of, I think it's unbelievable, <laughs> actually, to take it all and put it into some sort of coherent framework. So thank you very much for all you've done. Thank and you. And I know this may feel a little bit out in the future, but can you speak to us a little bit about implementation? Right. And once it is out, what happens next? No, we've been thinking about that, Ashley. I appreciate that. Um, it, it, we want to hit the ground running, of course, and I think that the, the first steps are to get our state house in order. There are many actions that we're proposing in the water resilience portfolio that will require a lot better coordination among agencies, across agencies. And so we're going to need teams. We're going to need a new way of thinking in some places and, and um, on certain issues. And um, we will have a work plan that we hope to turn around as quickly as possible. In fact, while we're, we're as the public feedback is coming in um, on the water resilience portfolio, we've got to start thinking about, okay, given what we're proposing to do here, what has to happen first? What is the order? What are the connections that have to be made? We'll be working on that. Yeah, and we'll obviously, gonna, we're going to need a lot of investment from stakeholders in that, those processes as well. So this isn't just the state. This is, you know, we're going to just need all the way through implementation, lots of feedback and input and help. Thank you, Nancy. And uh, you know what? I would just say what I've heard is from uh, the water resiliency portfolio, it's very smart, very well uh, organized, that it, um, that it is uh, forward thinking, that it is uh, uh, progressive. I think it, it is, uh, is the, everything I think we're looking for in, uh, in, in a uh, water portfolio. The, the, as far as delay, um, is, are there contentious issues or is uh, problematic concerns or just the complicated nature of water and getting it right and, and having it ready to go out that's uh, causing the delay or are there some areas of, that are still just persistent challenges that uh, uh, are causing a, um, a, a delay? I think it's the complicated nature of California water, the need to get it right, and the fact that the people who are involved are incredibly busy. So, you know, I'm, I'm the only person working full time on the portfolio. You've got a whole lot of people who are juggling what feels, looks to me like three other full time jobs. So that's part of it. Last March, uh, NACWA had a speaker at our annual meeting named uh, Ken Grossman, and he spoke to the brand Resilience uh, that he uh, came out with. And um, the, the response to that term uh, in, in relationship to the campfire and, and, uh, and Butte County was amazing. Uh, I think he uh, had like f three or four times the, the number of breweries that were responding to wanting to, um, to um, sell the Resilience brand uh, of, of beer. You know, I forgot about that when Eric asked his questions. That's right. 
Okay. Um, I'd like to thank you for all your hard work. I'd like to thank the secretary for her hard work and, um, you know, and thanking the administration for balancing these very, very complicated issues. But for the first time, I feel that there's optimism in a lot of areas that we're going to be able to move not only this portfolio, but the voluntary agreements forward and Sigma. And, but as you mentioned, um, you might have one job, but, but most of the, the moving pieces in this puzzle are, you know, one representative from my area or two. And, and so we, we have, we have, and even within the administration, there's only a couple point people. And so when you think of all the issues they're trying to juggle, you know, I hope we take enough time once this portfolio comes out. I, I realize the time frame you're under, but, but you need to let people react because, you know, the more we get this right, the better off we are. And I, I heard you say, well, we're going to give you a couple weeks and then January has got to go to the governor. Well, time timetable slip and I think I think getting this right and getting the buy-in is is really important and um, you know I, I think people have been optimistic on on uh, the progress of the voluntary agreements uh, I think the NGO still have concerns but um, at least it's all moving in a positive direction so uh, again I just thank you and uh, keep up the great work Don thank you and thank you so much for your input as well and the example that you folks set in Northern California in the Sac Valley. Any other questions? One, more, one oh, more. Sorry. Go ahead. I just, you know, I know you want to get to the governor by January, and I can you speak about that that time frame? Is that connected to the idea that this could help inform the, some of the bonds that are moving through the legislature? Well, there's a budget. There is. There are talks oh, okay. about a bond in the legislature as well, and obviously the portfolios. Um, actions cost <laughs> so there there are obvious questions about how do you pay for what you're proposing yeah and just being in a lot of other meetings besides this it's very important to think about we do want to get it right and that is the most important and some of my wisest friends are saying don't rush it just to meet an arbitrary deadline but it's also for any time that we might lose in a budget process to make sure we've got resources to begin implementation so that does tend to, to, like, we have to back up from that. And so I, I think there's a strong desire. That doesn't mean that it will happen because there's always may revise. But to the extent that it's possible and practical and we have the buy-in, which is critical, we want to be able to not miss an opportunity for real resources to begin implementation as quickly as possible. That's all. Mm -hmm. Can I make one other comment um, as it relates to time? Um, you mentioned, Nancy, that, um, you know, we're talking about probably a sea change within the regulatory environment also. And, and that's going to need time to sink in. Mm -hmm. And um, because, you know, if I was, if I was a regulator, it, it would take me a while to, to readjust because I'm, I've just not been operating in that type of environment. And, and the policy people have a little more flexibility than, than the people that work for those. So, so they're going to need to let some of this sink in and, and understand how their roles may change, and, uh, which, which will be challenging. That's true. And you're wise to think about the human aspect of all of this because it can trip you up if you don't, <laughs> as we all know. Okay. Well, Nancy, I know you need to run. Thank you again for presenting Thank to you. us today and look forward to hearing. Uh, Thank you, and I appreciate again all of your input and all your help. Thanks. Thank you. All right, Josh, what do we have? Other board, board committees? Why don't we maybe? Yep. Well, I think maybe we should talk about it and uh, maybe maybe Joy is the chair of it, right? So Joy, um, you know, we have on our on our uh, next agenda item board committees and uh, we have the broadband committee that you, you're uh, chairing. I wonder if we could maybe get a date scheduled or get a meeting, uh, get, you know, to where we can start moving forward and uh,
if I may, I think um, from a staff perspective, I think to more maybe formalize who's on the I broadband agree. committee to form it, and then we can start to schedule and work just like we've done the water committee in terms of setting schedules, et cetera. Ter terrific. Just as a by way of reminder, the ad hoc committee was formed November of 2018, and the members uh, are uh, Don, Martha Montoya, and Joy. Um, so number one would be if there's, you know, uh, anyone else who wants to be on the committee. Um, <laughs> Yay, Crystal! Yay! Right. But it would be changing the makeup from an ad hoc to kind of a more of a formal, formal committee. Formal board committee, yeah. So that would then be notice, agenda, everything. For next next month's uh, meeting, and uh, we'll okay, formalize terrific. it then. But I think we, we need to start thinking about what we can and can't well, do. Well, I, I think getting something done, I mean, that, that's the, been the frustration. I mean, we've had an ad hoc committee for a year, and um, you all got the um, my my latest update on the on the state of play, which is pretty. It's eight pages, um, and um, not nearly detailed enough. But um, I feel optimistic. I feel that we're at a tipping point, um, but we need um, some muscle, and um, at the highest level. Um, so while I feel, uh, you know, great about a committee, um, I think that the biggest thing is that we need to push as hard as we can on every level. So right now, the, uh, the three uh, paths that, um, that I'm taking are um, the Assembly, the Senate, and uh, the Governor's Office. Um, the, uh, it's very sad that the latest round of USDA funding for broadband California has received nothing. Yeah. Nothing. And I, if I were uh, in a position to recommend someone we should hear from, it would be uh, from USDA to explain to us why that is and how do we fix that. Um, there's so much money out there. Um, and the FCC is about to... Uh, 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 make another $20 billion worth of grants. And right now, the CPUC has sent comments to them saying, please don't do that until you revise your broadband maps, because the maps are A, inaccurate, and B, skew negatively for California. Um, so I think one of the things we need to do is to help back the CPUC um, and I think a letter uh, from this board uh, to the FCC, to uh, GPI, would be uh, definitely or in order. And I can get you the CPUC comments, but I think we want to, I think we definitely want to chime in on that. I think we want to learn why we're not getting any federal dollars um, and, and fix that. Um, and um, what else? Joy, yeah. Joy, we should CC the Ag Committee people like LaMalfa on that letter. We need to CC the Valley Ag people. Now LaMalfa's Brilliant. on the Ag Committee. Brilliant. We need the, congr the, the congressional delegation to please step up on both the FCC and USDA. It's like, really? Nothing? With, you Is know, 12% of the population and the tax revenue? Come on. I know we're in the doghouse with the current administration, which is a mark of honor. Is this another one of those issues where the rest of the country doesn't want to recognize the needs of rural California uh, or recognize that California has a rural, uh, a significant rural um, population? I think, I think part of it is the, um, the, some of the uh, unique characteristics of California agriculture that were specialty crops and not massive, Midwestern operations. I think that's part of it. Yeah, um, <laughs> and I think that um, um, our topography is uh, challenging. So I think that's another uh, part of it. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, we have um, so much opportunity uh, as we um, upgrade 
modernize our wiring in the state. And with that, presumably, we'll be trenching. And once you're trenching, you might as well put the fiber right in there. And um, so we just have, we have nothing but opportunity. And, you know, it doesn't, to me, it almost doesn't matter which topic you want to discuss, whether it's the water monitoring, um, whether it's uh, telehealth, whether it's rural prosperity, to, uh, whether it's the regions rising. At every single level, if we can accomplish this one solid win, so much will flow from that. They're doing it in Appalachia. Surely we can do it in California. Is this just, you know, what is it? Only two counties of California are, are actually on a federal, uh, from a federal recognition are actually considered rural and we don't, we don't qualify for funding um, in, in these areas that our federal funds just don't come here. Uh, is that, and, and, and as much as I've talked to our congressional representatives, they just say good luck um, getting that changed with as many rural, yeah. I applaud you, I applaud you, I applaud you, Joy. And I, uh, if you would like me on your committee, I would join, um, but I, I don't offer you very much of, um, of skill in this area, but um, uh, is it beneficial to move from uh, ad hoc to official, um, or is there a certain amount of work you want to have done uh, while you're ad hoc before you come uh, to official, or is officialness just beneficial right from this from the get go? I don't know that it makes any difference. Personally, I think I think the key is just getting the job done. So I, unless there's some, well, you know, I think the, the biggest thing is, is deploying whatever clout we have. Most importantly, our fearless leader. Um, and just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And, um, you know, I, I feel like I'm just boring. Because <laughs> it's all I want to talk about. But um, I just, I do not want to be talking about this in 2021. I really do not. And so, Crystal, your, your help would be just greatly appreciated. And then, Eric, you know, remember that project down in Ventura that you all are involved in? They're actually going to start trading water in uh, January. And they have 300 farmers connected through their own little back-of-the-truck stupid system and um and it's and it's just amazing that they're using blockchain technology in order to maintain the confidentiality of a water market um and as with so many things it's a question of how do we scale these things up which raises a question for me because i was sort of in the same place as bryce feeling like well i don't i don't feel like i personally can add much but is it possible for so i have you know, folks at EDF. You have could people. Add, well, I don't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> could, could could a could a board committee have an uh, ex officio member who was more knowledgeable than me personally? In other words, uh, Christina, who was in that project and made that project happen, would be a better representative of EDF to that process than me. But I'm just curious if that's legal or. Presenters, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things we've done in some of our yeah, work up. is use that, like to get everyone, I learned this from Joseph McIntyre, first you have to get everyone on a, the same level of understanding, so you use yeah. expertise to make presentations and to have everyone do that learning process together, and then they feel better informed to be able to make collective decisions, yeah. And I, this sounds fascinating, no, I, I didn't know the details of that. Would this be... Would we be comfortable inviting um, some of the um, providers to come testify to us?
that's a that there's well one thing we know is there's no guilting them into it they simply don't care and um and um but what about so then it I, it keeps coming back then that it either has to come from the governor's office or the capital the the uh the legislature and so that does take money and it takes money well, or even laying it out to the broadbound council as well. I mean, putting together the priorities that we're aware of, that we know need next steps, that I'm sure the broadband council is probably aware of as well, but laying it out to them in a formal letter saying, here are the key issues that we think need to be addressed and have the broadband council, again, secretary sits on that council and others from the administration to try to move that forward. Well, then do we need a formal committee in place? Would that carry more weight or with the whole board signing on, I would think. Well, the committee yeah. can go through a process of drafting a draft letter that comes to the board for approval right. versus, I mean, we could have board direction to work with staff, to work with members of the board to do letters where it does the same thing. But, but who does the broadband, uh, band, broadband council, who, who's on the council? Is it, I mean. It's, uh, it's headed right now by Amy, Amy Tong, who's the head of the Department of Technology. I don't know how she gets elected to that position. My dream would be for Karen to run that because there's a lethargy, in my opinion, at the California Broadband Council. Um, but uh, now with um, CDFA represented and the state librarian and um, the uh, governor's advisor on tribal affairs, just about every state agency is on there. So theoretically, this should all come together. This was put together by Alex Padilla in um, 08. And um, it's just a crying shame that absolutely it has effectuated nothing, um, which is really just an abomination. But the, uh, well, one thing it does pretty darn well is that it's pretty good about recycling used computers from the state to those in need. That, it, well, it's, I got credit where credit is due. due. <laughs> um, but um, so it, we need somebody to stand up and, and I guess it has to be someone bigger than me. Andy, go ahead. Keep, punch your mic. I gives you the stakeholders and who's in charge and what they've done to date. It's the uh, state of play. What you have, you have three things. You have uh, a letter, which I'm very proud, the Rural Caucus um, sign, which is, of course, my. And then um, at, there's something to be said for whether this board wants to um, tell the governor's office that we endorse uh, the way forward as presented by California Forward. And then you have an eight page state of play um, that tells you just about everything I know. Yeah, I, I'm very supportive of the, you know, the Broadband Council, but this seems to be right up our alley. I, I mean, we, I, I would. I think we need to continue to move forward and I think we need to continue to push. The Broadband Council meets three times a year and um, I have so far not seen anything. All right. I, I have a question. What, what's happening next with the region's rising effort where broadband is a central strategy and is well, there a that's way what, to... that's what Karen mentioned and I am not um, aware. Josh, are you aware of what's happening with region's rising? That's a very great question. Seems like that would be a good thing to be aligning with because that is all about rural California. If I had to pick a person I would like to meet with, um, that is uh, Lenny. Lenny Dozak. 
that's who I want to meet with. Yeah, isn't it? That's who we want to meet with. Because he's the one who actually announced this stakeholders meeting on behalf of the governor. No date has been set. Um, but if he is the point person, then, and I think he's also the point person for Regions Rising. So he, he to me, is the next key person. So, Crystal, well, we getting a meeting with him would be huge. Absolutely. I beg your pardon? We can connect you with Lenny. That's not, yeah. that's not what I'm going to do. I was just on a panel with Lenny um, around revitalization in Fresno. Um, he's also a friend of mine, um, so I've known him for years. But definitely, I think, and he's gotten this new office opened in the Central Valley Correct. around redevelopment. And so I think he's actually a terrific person. He's um, a tr to, to well, and he to also is a senior lecturer at Stanford, I think, on inequality. And it's like, well, shoot, this has got to be. All right, do we have any other business? Nancy. So as we end the year, um, I would like to first of all <coughs> commend the staff as usual, <coughs> uh, particularly for integrating some of the suggestions that we've made at the beginning of terms, uh, including that legislative update, which has been added now. And of course, uh, just thrilled to hear the progress on healthy soils. I would say this year's uh, the this year uh, the agenda items have been really fascinating, very critical, and important. And I just want to commend you uh, for arranging them. I have a couple suggestions, however. One would be that we unpack the meetings a little bit, because this kind of conversation is something that I hunger for, and I don't. Um, I always feel anxious when we cannot fully explore some things when we have good people in front of us because we're on the timeline. So I'm just wondering if we could perhaps just, uh, I know there's a lot we have to pay attention to, but if we could just do a little less per meeting, it might be that uh, it, would, it would be more comfortable and we might learn a little more. Uh, secondly, if we could add to your tasks the idea of announcing in advance when we have opportunities from the department like the sustainable farm tour for those of us who come up from the south we could actually arrange to stay over if we knew they were coming and i always feel a little regretful that i can't take advantage of some of the things that the department is doing because i i haven't made plans in advance yeah so, so, so i know that's a little tricky the, where, you know with soils week it's a it's a team effort with a variety of partners and so yeah. it wasn't directly organized by us but some of our stakeholder partners but yes yes okay well whatever you can do yes <laughs> and then finally i think it would be important and again this is a little more work uh that we stop using single-use plastic and uh sort of demonstrate our commitment to a more sustainable world where we can uh, maybe do that too. Eliminate water bottles, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> That's the yes. For a slight, slight fee. <laughs> there you go. All right. Sure, Crystal. So um, thanks. I, um, these meetings are terrific. I really appreciate all the work that you guys put into them. Um, about a year ago, I believe, um, we had a wonderful woman who came up who'd just been hired around the diversity and equity in the department, and I'm just wondering if there's a way for us to get some kind of report out on uh, where those, yeah. where that stands. Be so great. she was unfortunately here last month to give us an update, <laughs> uh, but we can definitely share that with you. And one of the things that is, I think that all of our members should be required to attend every meeting. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'd like to say. Um, but uh, one of the things, Crystal, to follow up on that is that as part of that position, there is a report that's due to the legislature by January 1st. That kind of is a summary of the work that's been done over the year. So that will be something that we'll definitely share with the board once that's finalized. Oh, no. <laughs> 
Um, one of the things I would like to recommend as other business is just from Nancy's presentation is that we have a water committee meeting once the um, draft is out so we can I, finalize I a plan so members of the water committee be prepared for kind of a short turnaround in terms of being able to have a meeting and kind of get recommendations so we can have board action at the January meeting the words right out of my mouth. to be able to approve a letter for yeah. comment if the timeline gets changed. Well, she started with two weeks and then went to said a month for public comment. So I think. Yeah, I don't know that they were actually planning on that. Because, you know, if, if it actually was out in December, you know, you could actually have some speakers come in around the historic polio on that first meeting in January, where we could have a discussion and feedback. And That's there are a lot of members of the administration who have been working on this water resilience historic polio. So. Yeah, but I think I'm. I'm placing bets on Don in terms of the timeline, but if that works out, but even out right, if that would be it's going to be so close, they can well, still that, be I talking about concepts. Well, not only that, I think we can start maybe putting a letter yeah. together because yeah. I think there's a lot of key issues yeah. that we we know we'll need to weigh in on. Okay. But we'll we'll definitely we can do some work. I also wanted to make sure that you eat in the folder is the 2020 meeting date. So to clarify that um, again, we're doing February 11th, which is not the first Tuesday, World Ag Expo in Tulare. March 31st and April 1st, two-day meeting, Salton Sea. And then I did revise from the original draft that was proposed to you. It was not the first Tuesday in December, so I think December 1st is the December date. Okay. That's in the draft you made. Yeah. Great. All right, anything else from the board? Well, again, a challenge that we have um, uh, with, I'm all for that, and I think it's great when the board has the opportunity to do that. It's just the quorum has been an issue in terms of doing some of our remote meetings, which has been very difficult. Mm -hmm. So if we are committed to doing more outreach and more offsite, it's more of the commitment of board members to be able to get down there, especially for, yes, when, Northern Cal when Southern California has to come to Northern California <laughs> and vice versa. <laughs> had that proposed. <laughs> and he was the one that said no. <laughs> he was the one that said no, let's not do that. <laughs> Maybe. All right. So Nancy? I just wanted to make the point that the, the last governor actually looked at attendance records. So I don't know if this governor is going to, but it might be that uh, we take that into account that participation is part of your responsibilities to Sam. Good point. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Don right. Cameron, thank you for the uh, chocolate. That is so, okay. so nice. Is that Nancy? Nancy? Thank you, Nancy. That is so, so nice. I, I'd, I'd be happy to take the credit, but I can't. <laughs> and last month's olive oil was just fabulous. It was. Yep. Mike, thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, what, one more thing, before we go to public comment, uh, there's a great story in PERC reports about uh, the monarch issue and, and our board member Eric Holsk has been quoted throughout here. So it's a great, great story. Good job, Eric. So yeah. All right. We're going to try to, yeah. Yeah, I it, I was going to send out, but they didn't have they didn't have the new edition up on their website. Oh. You know, I have a PDF of it, so I'll get it to Josh. So, uh, 
Anything else come up? Go ahead, Andy. I was going to say, it actually might be a good location also because, you know, they are, they've been sent back to redo the, uh, they've been given another year's worth of time to come up with the new ag order. And so they're looking at um, a modified approach that's going to satisfy the various interests. So I think it could be a particularly interesting time. Right. All right. Uh, anything else? We'll go ahead and open it up for public comment. Anyone that would like to speak? I don't want to talk. I don't get it. <laughs> Derek, how about you? <laughs> as the as the longest participating audience uh, member, he did. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, so uh, so have a great Christmas, and uh, we'll see you after the the new year. So thank you all. <laughs>